I should have known this week that something was coming. Um, usually I'm a little more uh, aware <laughs> when uh, the Lord is doing a work or is about to do a work. Uh, this week I had the grand privilege in my job of going through training on how to be a presenter. So how appropriate is that? Um, and I learned some things this week. Now I've been in front of groups many times. Um, and uh, one of the things I learned this week is that it's okay to have butterflies before you get up in front of a group of people. You just want those butterflies to fly in formation. <laughs> Today, I don't have butterflies. I think I have three crows that are fighting over a choice piece of roadkill. It is said that there's been studies done over many, many years. Every year they do surveys of people. And uh, what is our greatest fear? And you would think that fear of death would be the top of the list, but it's not. Anybody tell me what the greatest fear people have? Standing up in front of people and talking. Um, so bear with me. If I'm a little nervous, it's because I'm a little nervous. Um, and uh, I would think that the fear of death... Uh, at least for the unbeliever, should be first. Uh, I would think that uh, what's going to happen with my eternity should be my biggest concern. Uh, but unfortunately, the world doesn't quite see that. Uh, they, it is number two. Uh, I think for believers, though, we have that settled. Uh, so we can go on to number one, the fear of standing in front of a group of people and talking. Um, this week, the other reason I should have known something was coming was on Thursday. Um, I had a terrible day. Uh, just miserable um, I was full of thoughts of uh, uh, not conviction but condemnation. Um, the enemy was throwing every accusation that he could come up with at me. I was remembering things that I hadn't, don't want to remember and hadn't remembered in a long time. And these weren't like recent failures or sins or transgressions. These were things that have go back many, many years. And it was just ugly. It was the kind of things that just make you disgusted with yourself. I don't know if I'm the only one. I know I'm not the only one in the room, but I think some of you can appreciate those things in your past that come back. Uh, and I spent that entire day. Um, I'm, I'm in training with my colleagues that day, and I really believe they thought I was losing it because I found myself sitting there doing this <laughs> and talking out loud going, stop it, stop it, go away, leave me alone. And I looked around, all of a sudden things were quiet, and I looked around, and people were looking at me, and I'm going, oh, no, I better just hold my hands. And, um, that was my Thursday, and I'm serious. I mean, it's humorous now. Um, I went home, and fortunately, I have brothers that are around me, uh, and I did share with a brother uh, that truth, and we talked about it a little bit. But I should have known. Those are the things that happen when something is coming. And so... Friday, uh, I got a text message uh, from Ed, and first text message was, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> or voice message. I should have seen it coming. I still, I don't know, I must have been in a daze this week because I saw none of this coming. Um, and so I called him back, left a voicemail or sent a message or whatever. I said, oh, I'm doing okay, I'm doing fine. And so then I go to home fellowship on Friday nights and it's five minutes before home fellowship at 6.55 and I get a text message from Ted, and I, no, I mean Ed, Ted. <laughs> I look at my text message, and the first thing it says is, do you believe in free speech? <laughs> I knew better. See, I know, I've heard this line. That's a chickism. I'm going to talk a little bit about chickisms. Do you believe in free, I knew it was coming. I didn't have to read the rest of it at all. And those who were in my own fellowship that night saw me start to lose it. They're going, not now. I'm going, you know, I'm sitting there going, don't do this to me here. Um, you're going to, this would be a total distraction now. And then I had to go, okay, set it aside. Uh, reading the rest of the text message, uh, he went on to say that uh, uh, he was very, very tactful in this. He did not use the God clause. I like that. I appreciate that. He did not say, God has said that uh, you are to teach on Sunday. Uh, he knows better than to do that. He said instead, which was clever of him, he says, I believe that you are to teach on Sunday. So it's made it a little bit more difficult for me to say no, because if I were to say no, then I'm saying, I believe you're wrong. <laughs> so, uh, and I respect Ed and Ken and our leadership in this church and my pastor. 
enough to take that very seriously. So um, I'm not too quick to say, no, I think you're wrong. So I had to definitely give it an honest consideration. Then, to show you how not in tune I was, uh, he had in there, which is actually nice of them this time, they actually told me what they wanted me to teach on. Uh, he had in there that they wanted me to teach on Proverbs 29, which is a cue for all of you, if you want to turn to Proverbs 29, and raise your hand if you don't have a Bible, and the uh, ushers will hand them out for you. Uh, but he had in there that uh, teach on Proverbs 29. And I was thinking, what is Proverbs 29? What's the significance of Proverbs 29? I could not occur to me what could possibly be significant about Proverbs 29. So I, I, I'm, I'm in home fellowship. I'm, well, there, we're all talking. I'm actually browsing Proverbs 29, trying to figure out what the significance of this was. And I'm sitting there going, I don't see what the significance of Proverbs 29 is. And then I'm sitting there thinking, okay, Proverbs, Proverbs, Proverbs. What do I know? A proverb a day keeps Satan away. See, you all know that you've been here long enough. So a proverb a day. We've been encouraged to read a proverb a day. And then also this little voice goes in my mind and says, what's the date on Sunday? <laughs> That's how deep it really was. <laughs> I was looking for something with huge spiritual significance that related to me personally, and that's, that is how deep it really was. Uh, today's the 29th, and we're going to be going through Proverbs. So if you would turn with me to Proverbs. Um, Proverbs are, I love the book of Proverbs, and if you've ever gone through and actually done this exercise where you do a proverb a day, starting on the first, you read Proverbs 1, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, as you go through the month. Uh, and it is very, very fruitful. God will use that. And there is definitely a truth in that saying that a proverb a day does keep Satan away. Those little nuggets of information, those little sound bites, those quick pieces, uh, you know, Proverbs is very deep, and it's uh, the kind of thing in Scripture that you have to chew on, you have to meditate on. Uh, you're all aware that God's Word is food. And as now that we are spiritually born, we're born again, we become spiritual beings and we're alive, we need to be fed. And so we need to have a good diet of God's Word. And some of God's word is real easy to digest, easy to chew. It goes down real sweet. It, it's, you know, and other parts of God's word, in order to really get the nutrients out of it, to really appreciate it fully, you have to chew on it. You have to meditate on it. Proverbs is not a book that you want to read through quickly. I don't I ever suggest doing 10 chapters of Proverbs in a sitting. You will go, I have no idea what I just read. Proverbs are... One at a time, you need to take those and meditate on them and consider them, contemplate how that applies to you personally. Um, they're nuggets of wisdom and instruction. Uh, they're need, it's food that needs to be chewed upon. Um, uh, we also have Proverbs. You know, the world is full of Proverbs. There's a lot of slogans and, and sayings and things that we fall back on. Um, our church, we have kind of our own Proverbs, and they're biblical. Uh, but they're not necessarily from Scripture. Um, what are some of the ones that we have all heard? Uh, what we've heard, you're here now. You've all heard that, right? Say it with me. You're here now. Okay. I'm here now. We're here now. You're here now. That seems so simple, but when you start to meditate on the significance of that, it is incredibly wise and deep. I have... That's a, a saying that my pastor has used for years, uh, and it has had a huge impact on me. There are many, many times when I have simply meditated, that's come back to me, and I've stopped and just said, I'm here now. That means whatever happened yesterday is done. I may have things that I need to deal with because of whatever happened yesterday, but at, yesterday's gone and it's over. Fifteen years ago is gone and over, okay, for my day on Thursday. That was the thing I had to keep telling myself. I'm here now. It's not 15 years ago. I'm not doing those things. I'm here now. Um, tomorrow isn't here yet. I can plan for it and prepare for it. I can certainly be equipped for it. But all I really have is right now. So there's one. Um, I believe it's very biblical. Uh, but that, what I would be, what I would call kind of a Calvary Chapel, St. Paul proverb something that we all know, something we all hold on to, 
And if you meditate on that and let God use that, you'll actually find there's a, it's, a, it's very deep, and there's a great amount of wisdom in that. What are some of the others? Um, you might have heard this one before. Maybe you can finish this sentence. Blessed are the flexible for they shall not be broken. We're actually going to find Proverbs 29.1 has a nice parallel to that. So that is very scriptural. But that's not, those words are not in that format in scripture, but there is a real truth to that. Uh, Blessed are the flexible for they shall not be broken. Uh, Being adaptable, being able to uh, you know, deal with the situation, um, not being stiff-necked, as we're going to see. Um, there are some others. Um, there's a couple that have had a huge impact on me. I won't go into any depth into this because Bill Saxton told me that he would leave the room if I shared this story today <laughs> about my skydiving. <laughs> Those who sweat in training bleed less in battle. And stick to the plan, it'll save your life someday. I have held on to these. I'll give you the brief version. I've overused this story a few times, both in work, mostly in work lately. But a few years ago, I took up skydiving. My first jump, we spent the entire day uh, learning all of the things we needed to know. They talked a lot about emergency situations, what happens if uh, your chute doesn't open right, what happens if you have to find your own place to land. Uh, the whole day, I was sweating in training. Believe me, every time they said that, I was thinking, that doesn't really happen. That doesn't really happen. <laughs> okay? You're not, don't tell me that doesn't really happen. In fact, Rudy was with me that day. I think he remembers me asking that question a few times. Uh, tell me that doesn't happen. So what happens on my first jump? Uh, I get out the plane. Free fall is wonderful. Feel that chute open. That's a great feeling. Really is a very good feeling. Um, <laughs> I look up. And the lines are twisted. So I go, okay, now what? I follow the instructions. They taught me what to do. They shared exactly what to do. I got out of that. I pulled out my voice box. Um, and there I had a spotter on the ground who was speaking to me from the ground. And the first thing I hear is, Kevin, you're not going to make it back to the landing zone. You'll have to find your own place to land. And the last thing they told me was, Kevin, you're on your own. <laughs> Those who sweat. So here's a proverb that I had heard many times my pastor tell me. And people ask me, man, you must have been really praying at that time. I said, no, you know, there's a time for prayer and there's a time for action. <laughs> and I love God's word. I tell you what, the voice in my head was my pastor. Stick to the plan. It'll save your life someday. Those were the words that were in my head. So um, these are examples of proverbs that I have heard, that you have heard. Uh, that come from those around us that have had a huge influence in my life. And this is what we're going to look at when we go through. There's also, for me, there's also, you know, I don't, you know, so you don't misunderstand, I love God's Word. God's Word is with me all the time. I, I reflect on it. It comes back to me when I need it. Um, even in this last couple of weeks, I was thinking of a couple of the Proverbs um, outside of 29 that have really had an influence on me, even in the last couple of weeks. And one of them is, Proverbs 18.1, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. I have a tendency to isolate myself, and this is one uh, proverb that God brings back to remembrance, to remember, remembrance for me, uh, so I can remind myself not to, be, not to isolate myself. Uh, I'm sure that I'm not the only one in the room who has that tendency to do that. Um, another one, one of my favorites, I can't talk about Proverbs without sharing Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, actually, a little further along than what you have on your placard on your wall. Uh, But that is, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. These are actually two proverbs that um, I have fed upon and have digested and are now a part of me that have come to my remembrance in the last couple of weeks in different situations when I've needed them. Um, So 
Let's read through Proverbs 29, and then we're actually just going to kind of walk through and talk about some of the different things. Uh, what I love about Proverbs is it's kind of like a smorgasbord, kind of like the buffet. You know, we come into you know, here and we've got all these little nuggets of information. This is one of those opportunities where you actually get to, not just get to, but have to kind of bounce all over the place, because Proverbs tend to bounce all over the place. Uh, so... I think of it kind of as the buffet. I kind of think of it as that this morning we're on a picnic, and together we might as well put on our bibs because it might get very messy. So I apologize for that, but hopefully by the time we're done, um, it'll all come together. So let's read through Proverbs 29. I know you're there and I'm not, so let's get there. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Whoever loves wisdom makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots wastes his wealth. The king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. By transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. Scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath. If a wise man contends with a foolish man, whether the fool rages or laughs, there is no peace. The bloodthirsty hate the blameless, but the upright seek his well-being. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. The poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous will see their fall. Correct your son, and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. A servant will not be corrected by mere words, for though he understands, he will not respond. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. He who pampers his servant from childhood will have him as a son in the end. An angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgression. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Whoever is a partner with a thief hates his own life. He swears to tell the truth, but reveals nothing. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, but justice for man comes from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. A few little tips or suggestions in terms of how to approach God's Word in general, but also the Proverbs specifically. Um, first one is always take the passage that you're looking at in context. In context of, it, of the passage, but also in context of all of God's Word. Uh, now Proverbs, kind of hard to take some of those in context because they seem to bounce from thought to thought to thought. But you'll find that as you go through a passage in, in, in Proverbs, that there are themes. There are themes throughout the entire book of Proverbs. Wisdom, um, relationships of uh, parents and children, 
relationships with uh, harlots for us men. Um, there are themes that go throughout the, the book of Proverbs, and you can follow those themes. Uh, there's a theme in this particular chapter, which is also a theme throughout the rest of Proverbs, and that is the wicked versus the righteous. And that was one of the big themes I found in this. But whenever you're looking at any passage of Scripture, and especially looking through Proverbs, you want to make sure that you're putting it in context with all of God's Word. Because it's easy to get tripped up uh, if you're not looking at the full, uh, all, of, all of God's counsel, the full counsel of God's Word. And we'll see how that can happen. Um, you know, if you take one little verse out of context, it becomes a pretext and all kinds of false doctrines and heresies and things can come out of that. That's the biggest danger that people have, and that's where a lot of error has come out among the body over the years, over the centuries, is because of the people who have taken a piece of Scripture out of context and let it get blown into something more other than what God intended for. Uh, one of the themes that I find through here is this, the, the theme of the righteous versus the wicked or evil man. Now, so I'm not talking to only half of the group here. I'm going to say evil man or woman. Okay, so women, I'm going to include you in this. So I know you want to sit there and go, okay, yeah, it's the guy next to me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to embrace all of you. You can do what you want with that. Uh, but uh, if God's word were to be written, uh, you know, to be politically correct today, um, it would <laughs> be written quite a bit differently, I believe. So um, God's word embraces Humanity. There are passages that are specific to the sisters. There are passages that are specific to the brothers. Uh, but in, unless it's obvious within the passage, the, uh, the, the gender identifiers in here are for all. So we're going to include all when I'm talking about this. Um, I mentioned before this whole righteousness versus wickedness or the evil man. In this chapter, we have verse 2, 6, 7, 14, and 27. We're going to actually walk through all of these again. Uh, I'm going to just share some of the nuggets of things that God has given me as I was reading this. Um, some will be deeper than others. Some will be more meaningful than others. But that's really my approach to, to this today uh, would be to just kind of walk through. But because I saw this big theme in here of the righteous versus the wicked, and my week was dealing with my own relationship of righteousness versus wickedness, this is the piece that hit me the hardest. First time I read through this, I thought, well, there's not that much there. This isn't going to be a problem. I'm not going to have to get, I'm not going to have to get hit hard on a personal level. And then the second time through it, I saw this theme in there and went, oh, Thursday, here it comes again. Um, but Fortunately, God used it as an opportunity for encouragement. So I definitely want to share that because that's the biggest piece that God has given me from this. He may give you something else, but I think this is something that I think a lot of you probably need to hear. Uh, and that's this discussion of who are the righteous, who are the wicked. Does sinning, anybody here... I'll rephrase that, because I don't want you to answer this question. If any, of you here, here, if any of you here believe you are not a sinner, then you should talk to me or somebody after this, and we can talk to you about that. Um, I'm confident that every believer in this room sins. So does sinning make me a wicked, uh, identified with the wicked? Okay. These are questions I had to begin to ask myself. Am I counted among the righteous? Am I accounted among the wicked. Years ago, uh, it's been a while now, 2001, God had crushed me. Um, that's a story for another time. Uh, but I had come back and uh, God was dealing with me. And I remember um, talking to Chick. He, Chick had given a message on the tares and the wheat. You know, the passage in the Gospels about the tares growing up <clears throat> alongside of the wheat. wheat. And the believer being the wheat, and the tares being the un <clears throat> those that have infiltrated, those that are not really a part of the, you know, what God has. And I remember in fear going up to Chick afterwards and asking him timidly, really, am I a tear or am I a or, or am I the wheat? And with confidence, he looked at me and said, he's known me for a long, had known me for a long time. He says, Kevin, you are the wheat. And I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that I was a part of. 
I, I wasn't the goat, I was the sheep. So though, that was an encouragement I needed to hear at that time. And for some of you, that might be an encouragement that you're going to need to hear today. Are you counted among the righteous? Am I causing problems here moving around? Um, <clears throat> I just heard noise. Are you counted among the righteous or among the wicked? Does sinning by itself make me a wicked man? Now, I can honestly say, as a believer, I've done things, as I look in Scripture, that would be counted among the wicked. And I know we all, well, I think a lot of us all, have can kind of share that same testimony. I'm not here to dump things out here, or guard, this isn't you know, confession time. <clears throat> Those who know me know me, and they know what I'm talking about. Um, but then I look through Scripture, <clears throat> and I go, what are my examples? And I looked at, and I started to think about, well, there are a lot of people in Scripture that I believe are godly, uh, who are definitely one of God's children, who are going to be there with us in God's kingdom, who had done some things that I know would be counted as wickedness. I thought of David. Here's a man after God's own heart, very close to the heart of God. But here's a man who, out of his lust, uh, manipulated, and then had relationships with a married woman, Bathsheba, and then to cover it up, uh, brought in her husband and had him killed. And, you know, this, these are things that easily you would count as being very wicked things that he did. But here's a man, and he suffered consequences for that. Uh, but here's a man that I believe is counted among the righteous. I thought of Lot. If anybody knows the story of Lot, and he's uh, turned his eyes towards Sodom and Gomorrah because it was green and prosperous, and so that's where he settled. And then we find him later sitting in the gate of the city as one of the leaders when the angels come to destroy it. And you think, Lot, how did you end up that far away from what God had for you? And then we read in Corinthians, I believe, where it says, and righteous man Lot was vexed in his soul. And you kind of wonder, you go, God sees Lot as a righteous man. See, and I think that is absolutely incredible to me. First, it's almost inconceivable, and then it's a huge encouragement. I go, if God can see Lot and David with their lives and the failings that they've had as a righteous man, then I might have hope. And then the one that really gives me the full hope is Samson. And I'm not going to go off on Samson. I just want to make a point about Samson. And here's a man who absolutely lived a life of self-indulgence, totally self-centered, uh, totally engaged in pursuing lust and uh, relationships that God had not ordained. And all the way to the end of his life, this guy just seemed to never get it right. And at the very end of his life, he has one half-hearted act of faith, really, because he really wasn't doing it because of, you know, a heart of repentance. You know, when he pushed on those pillars and brought them down and destroyed the Philistines along with himself, uh, it was because to venge, him, to venge him for his eyes. But here's a man in the great hall of faith in Hebrews who is mentioned as a man of faith, counted among the righteous. And so, what constitutes righteousness? Um, we're going to take a look at a couple of passages outside of 29 here. Um, first of all, we want to look at Romans 4. If you'd go with me there. Hold your finger back in uh, Proverbs. Let's go to Romans 4. These are all fully, this is all a reminder for you, and these are things that we need to be reminded of. And if this is new to you, hopefully it's going to be refreshing. What then sh shall we say, that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. 
Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. There's a lot of passages we could look at. Um, The fact is that we are righteous before God because of our faith in him. And as James will tell us, faith is not dead. There will be evidence of your faith. It's not just saying I believe something. If I honestly have faith in it, it's going to affect how I act. But I can stand with confidence before God today because of faith, not because of my works. Um, All the good works I could possibly do would never overcome the bad works, that I, the, the, the wickedness that has gone on before. I think we could all probably share that same thing. But I now can stand boldly before God and in confidence and assurance of my salvation because of my faith, uh, because of my relationship I have with him through faith. Now, if I choose to transgress, if I choose to act in, wi- in wickedness, Um, I put a stress and attention in my relationship with God that can be very miserable. And I put a question mark for me on the assurance of that salvation. I am 100% convinced that if you are one of God's children, you can't change that fact. If you're once saved, always saved, if you abide in him or he abides in you. And I am thoroughly convinced of that. And I want to suggest that everyone in here needs to become thoroughly convinced for themselves of what that, their relationship is with God. And not just settle on what others have told you or believe, you know, certainly start by believing those that uh, you trust. But this is one of those things to own your own faith, to take hold of God's word and go back into scripture and, and really own it for yourself and have that confidence that says, I know that I am one of his children. Um, I know that I don't always live up to that. I know that there are times when I willfully disregard that relationship, but I know with full confidence that I am one of his children. Now, the thing that we can do, and I have done in my own walk, is I have definitely put a question mark for myself on that assurance that I'm one of his children. When I came back in 2001, um, I went to Chick and I said, you know, I don't even know if I'm saved. And he looked at me. I was, I was, I was looking for the warm fuzzies. I was looking for somebody to go, oh, Kevin, it's... I was talking to Chick, and I was expecting warm fuzzies. Um, uh, I should have known better. Um, I didn't get warm fuzzies, but I, got, I, I heard what I needed to hear. And then he says, Kevin, you should be afraid. You should be concerned about that assurance. And if we consistently, willfully walk in disobedience, the, the healthiest thing that can happen to us is that we develop a fear for our salvation. Now, it doesn't mean that we are or we are not saved, but if we want to have an assurance of our salvation, then we walk with him. Go back and read 1 John and look through that again and understand what it means to abide in him. And that doesn't mean that we've achieved perfection or that we have overcome all sin in our life. It means that there is an ongoing work of faith. There's always there's an ongoing work of redemption going on in our lives that's evidence that we have that relationship with him. Um, let's go to another passage, and then we're actually going to start walking through. This is the, the deep meat part of this. Uh, there will be some good nuggets after this, but this was the thing that was most on my heart to share with you today. Uh, let's go to Ezekiel. I want to show you that this isn't just a New Testament. There is some ideas that, well, there's the God of the Old Testament, and they were under the law, and um, because they were under the law, and there's some truth in that, they were under the law, the full redemption had not come yet, so they didn't really get to appreciate the full grace that God had intended. But did you know that salvation for Old Testament believers is the same as salvation for the New Testament believers? Just the Old Old Testament believers are waiting for it to come, and the New Testament believers, are, it, it has come. Okay? So it's always by faith. Our relationship with God is by faith, not by works. And that was true for the Old Testament as well. 
Uh, and let's look at, uh, and there's also this version, vision, I'll get you there, 18, go to Ezekiel 18 while I keep rambling on, 21. Um, this idea that somehow the God of the Old Testament is this mean, vengeful God, harsh, legalistic, and the God of the New Testament is warm fuzzies and puppies and loving. Um, read the New Testament again. There's some pretty tough, some of the toughest passages for me are in the New Testament, personally. Uh, there are some really harsh things in there that are challenging for me. But it's the God of the Old Testament is the same as the New Testament. He's not changed. But uh, now in Ezekiel, God is addressing his children, the Israelites. And we're going to pick it up in 1821. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done. He shall live. Do I have any pleasure? I want you to listen to this. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? The heart of God does not desire that any should perish. He desires that all should come to that relationship. He gets no pleasure out of it. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, 24, and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair? and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair, and your ways which are not fair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be, in your, be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, for why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. If you want an assurance of your salvation, repent, come into the light, and begin walking with the Lord. And then you can get up and say, I, I have total assurance of my salvation. Let's go back and walk through now some of these passages, uh, verses in Proverbs 29. And I'm going to share just some of the thoughts and things that God gave me. I'm going to try and keep track of the time a little bit. It works out pretty good. Verse 1, he who is often rebuked and hardens his heart will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. A couple of things I thought about here. Pharaoh. I thought of Pharaoh, he who stiff-necked, stiff-necked, did I get that right? I don't know what that meant. Um, he was often rebuked and hardens his neck, okay? Pharaoh hardened his heart, and each plague would come, and Pharaoh continually hardened his heart. And then it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What God simply did was strengthen Pharaoh's resolve. Pharaoh had already decided that he was doesn't matter what happened. I don't know if you've met people like that. It doesn't really matter. The more you say, the more they see, the more you know they understand, the more stiff-necked they become. It's like they are determined that they are not going to hear. And there's only so much you can do in that place. And their destruction is, is sudden. It says, 
will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. That's a sad place to be. And it's really even sadder when you see believers who come to that point where they start becoming very stiff-necked and not willing to hear or receive from others around them. Verse 2, we'll skip because that was the righteous and the wicked. Verse 3, whoever loves wisdom makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots wastes his wealth. All right, that's enough said about that. There's a lot that could be said about that. Verse 4, the king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. You know, the first thing that came to my mind was in our political system were special interest groups and how the influence of the few affect the many. Um, it's a little different. I don't know why that's what came to me. That's exactly what came to me in our particular system. Certainly there are those that are outright bribes, but I was thinking in terms of what's acceptable in our system and the whole uh, lobbying and pre special interests getting, uh, the, having have a, a stronger voice than the, uh, than the average person does. Um, that's kind of what I thought of when I saw the king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. Verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. It's kind of interesting with Proverbs. Now, uh, sometimes I read these and I think, okay, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. He spreads a net for whose feet? His own feet? Meaning those who are given to flattery are just going to entrap themselves? That's worth exploring. You know, Taking these and thinking them through, chewing on them, meditating them, that's what I did, meditating on them, that's what I've been doing since I was asked to do this. Taking each one of these and going, okay, a man who flatters his neighbor. I go, okay, flattery, I can certainly understand that, but spreads a net for his feet. Okay, I, know, I suppose if I dug into the language more, I might actually get an answer to that question, but just using what I have, uh, is he spreading a net for his own feet, or is the man who flatters his neighbor spreading a net for his neighbor's feet. He's entrapping him. So either way, you could, God, God could show you something from this. Um, <clears throat> I know for me, I took the second, uh, that a man who flatters his neighbor is setting a trap for him. And I don't know about you, if you've ever had people who, I, I don't trust flattery, uh, depending on where, especially almost any flattery, but depending on where it's coming from, sometimes there's honest compliments. Uh, but there's a difference between an honest compliment or encouragement and flattery. And uh, you know, frequently, you know, we all get that at times. And I, my first thought is, what do you want? <laughs> You're setting me up for something. <clears throat> so I took it that way. And using some caution, I, get, I become a little cautious when I start hearing flattery. And um, you know, another proverb is in 26, 28. It says, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it and a faltering mouth works ruin. <clears throat> uh, the, we can, you know, we have to be on guard for those people who uh, might have an agenda for us. Um, and it's really sad when we do that amongst each other, it still happens. There are times when that happens. Uh, in this church, I think it happens less than, a lot, than in a lot of churches because we tend to be very astute uh, about those things. But uh, the Lying tongue, a man who flatters his neighbor, spreads a net for his feet. <clears throat> Verse 6, by transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. By transgression, an evil man is snared, but the righteous sings and rejoices. We have the evil man and the righteousness again, but some of the thoughts I had was sin will find you out. I can... Personally, attest to that. I know many of you can. Sin will find you out. Uh, you may think you're getting away with something for a period of time. Eventually, sin will find you out. And there is the great encouragement that one day all things will be revealed. I'm not looking forward to that day, so I decided to get ahead of the game and reveal the stuff for myself because I didn't want it to be a surprise. So uh, you, can either have, you can either be open and honest about it now or you can wait till then, but... Uh, I kind of took that from this, and I get that, you know, the transgression an evil man is snared. Um, but the righteous, I mean, what is it about the righteous that would give them a good countenance, uh, be able to sing and rejoice? They have a clear conscience. Uh, 
Uh, they're not having to think about what might happen or what will happen. Is that a cue over there, Tim? Oh. Okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> Subtle cue, thank you. What are some others? We don't have to go through everything that's in here because you know, there's so much in any one of these that you can take away. Um, verse 20, do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Makes me think of James 1.19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Um, Twenty-six, many seek the ruler's favor, but justice for man comes from the Lord. And I thought of the justice versus mercy, and how I really don't want God's justice in my life, I really want his mercy. I do not want to get what I deserve. I want to get God's grace. important one to me is uh, there's a couple of them here that deal with being controlled by your emotions. An angry man stirs up strife and a furious man abounds in transgression, verse 22. And there was, uh, verse 11, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Uh, that uh, God has created us as emotional beings, but our emotions are flawed and they've been corrupted by sin and the fall, and we need to make sure that we're careful about our emotions, that we, let, we certainly enjoy what God has given us, but that we don't make decisions or we don't react or act out of our emotions. And anger is one of those that is a huge one that can affect people's lives and uh, uh, not allowing us to be driven by our emotions. And there are other emotions, and we all have, at varying degrees, struggles with those things, to not be driven by our emotions. Proverbs are full of these nuggets that can be meditated on and contemplated and fed on and taken with you. Um, in conclusion, what I want to do is I want to read from James 1. You can turn there with me if you would. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Obedience is the safety net for the believer. I also am convinced that obedience is our first and greatest act of worship. All other worship in our lives follows. If we're not walking in obedience, all other worship that we might have becomes clanging gongs. Uh, but when we act, walk in obedience, then we are free to worship. And we're free to walk in confidence. We have an assurance of our salvation. Uh, so with that, I turn over.